series. Today's topic is partial discharge and tan delta applications for improving grid resiliency. In this session, we'll be discussing how to use PD and TD testing to diagnose the condition of your cable installation. Uh, my name is Greg Valdez, and we can forward the slide real quick. Uh, I am the Marketing Communications Manager for uh, Mega North America, and I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentation. Uh, I will also be supporting you on any technical issues or questions for our presenter during the session. Uh, next slide. Okay, on the right side of your screen, you will see a control panel that looks similar to this one. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing in the box highlighted in red, and I will read the questions out during the Q&A segments. You will receive a copy of the presentation afterwards and a link to the recorded session if you want to watch it again or share it with your colleagues. Remember, you can ask questions at any time during the presentation, and I will interject them as we have time. Okay, next slide. Our presenter today is Henny Notgen. Megger's product manager for cable products. Henning is based out of our Valley Forge office in Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining us, Henning. Thank you. Okay, hello everybody, and welcome to our uh, webinar today. And um, we like to talk about uh, partial discharge testing and tendenza testing, and they uh, how they can be utilized in increasing reliability in in uh, cable networks. Uh, if we look at, on the first slide, uh, if you look at a piece of cable, there are five areas that are of concern. Um, uh, we start from the left to the right. We see the terminations. Terminations uh, can present a local issue in terms of cable reliability. Then going to the next one, we have the insulation itself say XLP or EPR or paper cable, whatever it is. And uh, we the the issue we have to consider there is the, the aging con the aging of the insulation over 30, 40, 50 years. The aging condition is uh, we call it global because it's typically not uh, limited to a particular area, but it's basically the aging of the entire Insulation throughout the cable system. Then the uh, the third issue we might encounter is a jacket, or all basically all power cables today are jacketed cables, and obviously the jacket uh, uh, offers some protection against uh, mainly water ingress or moisture ingress. And so if the jacket is uh, is uh, um, damaged, then this can lead to uh, moisture ingress and eventually to water treeing and, and failure of the cable. So we uh, jacket is also something we also want to want to be looking at, but it's a local, typically a local issue. Then we have the joints or splices, which are also a low of local nature. So uh, most of the time uh, when we have, uh, when we deal with uh, uh, splice issues they are related to uh, to uh, to workmanship and the uh, on the right side you see again insulation and the insulation could also have some local issues but uh, they are typically induced they are opposite to the aging that we talked about before the if we have local issues to the insulation they're typically uh, a result of the installation process. So to summarize it, local are localized within the cable and global are throughout the installation. So we differentiate between these two, uh, two types of, of issues we might encounter. Uh, just to show you uh, a little, uh, 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 let's say, reality here. And you see here terminations. You see one termination good, one termination bad. On the global aging of the insulation, you see a, a very consistent number of water trees, and especially also the size of these water trees is very consistent. That is a typical aging condition of a XLP cable that you see here. Then the jacket, you see this was happened to be a wind farm cable, and you can see uh, on the on the on the bottom. Uh, photo, you can see really how it it blew out right through a, 
through the insulation. And uh, if you look on the top picture, you can see uh, there were some some pretty bad uh, uh, rocks in that trench and putting pressure on it and eventually causing the failure of the cable. Then you see in the joint splice area, you see probably you have seen it many times yourself. Uh, most of the splice failures occur at the at both of the ends of the splice, where the splice overlaps with the uh, with the uh, cable. Uh, not so many faults you see anymore in the middle of the splice. And then on the right hand side, you see a cross section of an XLP cable with a very localized insulation damage, and you see one huge water tree there, and obviously this had to do with either the installation, there was some some uh, high stress point in the installation that eventually led to the form formation of water trees. But if you look at that one compared to the second from the left, you see there's a big difference between the dispersion of these water trees and that's why one is a local issue and one is a global issue. So you can see we're only dealing with one type of global issue which is really true to aging condition of the cable and all the local issues are pretty much related to the installation process of the cable. Um, so what is the objective of testing and diagnostic of power distribution cable? We want to increase the reliability and as a consequence of this also we want to have a reduction in the outage minutes. This is pretty much a driving factor in today's business environment in the utility industry. Um, so what is the strategy to increase circuit reliability over the cable life? You know, it starts with the acceptance test of a new circuit it ends with the cable replacement and in between we have the periodic maintenance test of service age cable circuits. So we have to, from a testing and diagnostics point of view, we deal with the first with the acceptance test and we deal with periodic maintenance test. So acceptance testing of new circuits, uh, we do those to mainly identify potential workmanship issues. Uh, and I'm just listing the components we have in a circuit, which is a cable. Typically, uh, we we don't have you know we don't have uh, much of let's say uh, a concern about a, a new cable if it's purchased from a reputable cable manufacturer. Cables have improved quality of cables, especially extruded cables, which represent the majority of cables used today. They have improved in in uh, quality substantially over, let's say, the past uh, 20 years. Uh, but we are concerned about the cable from a workmanship issue. For instance, bending radi radii or pulling force on cables. Those can affect the cable itself. Then we look obviously splices, which is a workmanship issue if improperly installed or maybe there were some some compromises done to to install a, a splice. And then the same is true for, for terminations. So really what we're trying to do with the acceptance test, for the most part we're trying to flush out workmanship issues. So what are the acceptance test methods? Uh, we could do, you know, very common, very well known, a, a high pot withstand test, either with or without monitoring, and we can do a a partial discharge diagnostic test. Uh, you know, the high pot test is a very common test; it has been done for many, many years, and uh, you know, back to the days when we installed paper cables. And uh, uh, today, we, for the most part, w you know, the DC high pot test is superseded by the VLF type AC high pot test, and that had to do with the fact that we, for the most part, ha are dealing with uh, solid dielectric cables, which don't take very well to DC high pot testing. And so, if we do a regular high pot test according to IEEE 400.2. Uh, the, the, the voltage specified is 3 per unit, the V0 is the uh, the phase voltage to ground, and uh, that is typically the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the voltage specified for a 0.1 hertz VLF test set. And what will it do? 
what will this test reveal to us? If he had severe workmanship defects in joints and terminations, and if we have severe cable damage from the installation. Um, and uh, so uh, the, the, the issue is, uh, that's why I underlined the word severe, because if there are, let's say, smaller type defects in these categories, the HYPO test typically will not uh, 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 ma make them fail, basically. You know, the way we can see that we have an issue or not is basically by, by failing the cable at that location. So, you know, if we have a localized defect, we basically we convert that localized defect by the high pot voltage to a to a real cable fault and then we locate the fault, we know where it is and we 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 cut that piece of cable out and put a splice in. So, that is the 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 uh, you know what a hyper test can do for us it's like a screening test to screen out the real severe and bad situations but it cannot tell you by pass it's a pass and typically a go no go test so if it passes it doesn't tell you what kind of what kind of a margin the test is passing uh, so uh, it, there is i think some some knowledge about once you pass a high pot test, typically you can expect to have maybe a, a a two year three period or two or three year period without any trouble on the cable. But there are situations where this is that assumption is incorrect. The uh, the uh, and that's where you know we come in and and uh, if we do not just a plain high pot test, but we do a monitored withstand test. Where we monitor certain certain parameters, then uh, we can see, uh, you know, during the duration of the test, uh, basically whether this cable is is going to fail or not, um, and that's why you know a monitored high pot test I think is a gives you more information than just a plain go no go go no go high pot test. If we if we really want to want to see how good or how bad a cable is, then the PD test is a very uh, very good tool, and um, because it cannot only tell us how bad or how good it is, it can also, as the only test method overall in all cable testing, tell us where the defect is. It can localize the the the, the problem, and uh, you know I know some people might say, well, PD testing it only can tell you about certain defects, and that's correct because you need basically a high a high resistance defect for to get a discharge, so it can pick be picked up as a partial discharge. But for the most part, workmanship issues in splices and terminations are this type of of problem, because you have in different type materials you you uh, you assembling on top of each other, and whenever you have very small gaps between, that's where you have PD building up. So it is a I think a fair assumption to say that a partial distance test is a a is a very good test to find out whether you have issues in splices and terminations uh, in terms of acceptance testing and um, uh, so uh, these two these two methods are available and like I said there is the 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 the, the monitor withstand test there are different ways to monitor a high pot test. You can use actually partial discharge levels to monitor a high pot test. You can you can use 10 delta uh, to monitor a high pot test, and you can use also leakage current to measure a high pot test. Uh, and and I I mention this because one of the VLF technologies allows to measure leakage current during the test like you would have done in, in the old days on uh, on paper cables. Uh, the 10 delta, using 10 delta as a monitoring tool is maybe a little bit questionable for the simple reason that 10 delta test, we normally do 10 delta test to determine the aging condition of cables. And since we are dealing on acceptance tests with brand new cables, the 10 delta information uh, 
which is a global a global parameter for the cable installation, might not be telling us the real the or might not give us a real indication because there is no aging condition at that point in time. So now, if we look at periodic maintenance tests, uh, what methods do we have? We can use VLF 10 Delta. Uh, it, it will, it's typically perceived as the method of choice today to detect treeing in cable insulation, especially in XRP cables. Uh, I can use a VLF hypot test to, to see cable treeing, but then it has to be at the point that it will fail. Okay, so differently, it's not really a diagnostic test, it's more a, a hypot test, a go no go test. Uh, I can do uh, the, uh, a partial discharge test at power frequency to, uh, to uh, analyze joints, and uh, uh, you know, and the same thing is true obviously for terminations. And by doing that, I can see whether joints or terminations have any workmanship issues because there's a very simple rule. A brand new splice or termination should have zero PD. As carried out as a field measurement. Because we're not talking about factory testing here. We have to do these tests, these acceptance tests and the periodic maintenance tests as field tests, which is a very different environment than what the manufacturers can do in their manufacturing plants when they test these accessories or cables. And then we have 10 Delta, uh, uh, the VLF 10 Delta test, and it can also, it can also Aside from the first item where I mentioned 10 delta it gives the aging condition of cable of the cable insulation, it can be also an indication of of aging in terminations. And um, a, especially when you have a, we talk about a little later, the delta 10 delta, where you look at the change of 10 delta over different voltage steps, it can be a very uh, good indicator of uh, problems in terminations simply because you have a lot of leakage on, on H terminations, you can have leakage over the termination and that creates this, this effect. And, uh, and basically, obviously, if we use a VLF hypo test on a termination, then we can also use that, but that's a hypo test again. So we have a choice between basically hypo testing and diagnostic test methods. The test parameters are you can see typically for the diagnostic test, the voltage levels are much lower than for the high pot test. You can see here on the bottom of the slide, the VLF 10 delta, the tip up is typically performed at 0.51 and one U naught, one and a half U naught, where the VLF high pot test is for maintenance carried out about at 2.5 U naught. So it's a, it's, a, it's a substantially higher voltage. Partial discharge testing, when carried out at power frequency, typically between, we typically use 1.7 U-naught, maybe 2 U-naught, but most of the time people do not want to go higher on power frequency PD testing than 2 U-naught. This is just basically a little chart to, to show you uh, what type of defects you might have in in certain type of cables, and um, uh, you can see, uh, you know, paper cables don't show any water trees, uh, but uh, but uh, you know, was, all cables show the same issues with splices, and so it it depends. You know, there are some some testing methods that are very specific to specific defects. And, and really you can say the 10 delta is very specific to the aging condition caused by water trees. That is, a, that is the, the big benefit because we have so many XRP cables in the field today that we like to monitor the aging condition and to make replacement decisions on it. And that's why the 10 delta is a, is a good tool uh, to, to do that. Uh, I can have, on the other side, I can have, if I have severe water tree damage in cables, 
uh, there are water trees that will not show up on the, you know, if I have individual really substantial water trees in a in a cable in a local area, they would not show up as a global measurement on the 10 delta, but they would certainly fail under a, a, a high pot condition. So, oh, hey. uh, yes. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. We have one question. Does VLF testing accelerate electrical treen in an XLPE cable if they're already present? Well, if you have an electrical tree, the under the VLF, under the VLF condition, the electrical trees at the voltage as prescribed in the test will grow faster than under 60 hertz conditions. That is one of the reasons why it's very beneficial to do a VLF test because otherwise if the growth rate would be the same, there would be no sense in doing it because you could not get the get the, the cable to fail during the test time, then it you just would, would run you know, normal operating conditions. The electrical tree will grow much faster at, at, uh, at 0.1 hertz at 2.5 or 3 per unit test voltage. That is correct. And it's a, it's a welcome effect that it does. It. It's like any type of testing you do, whether it's mechanical or thermal testing, you typically do under accelerated conditions, and actually this is the acceleration effect. Um, if we go uh, as, as a summary to the next slide, uh, uh, you know, we, we have acceptance tests of new circuits. Typically we have, uh, you know, 0.1 hertz, uh, VLF high pot testing, which will find all major weak spots, um, and we have uh, we can do a a VLF monitored high pot test where we use leakage current 10 delta or PD. Like I said, 10 delta is a little uh, questionable the 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 benefit of that, and we can do partial discharge testing, obviously. So. Uh, uh, Actually, to do it in one test, if you do a monitored high pot test where you use PD as a monitoring level, then that is basically, I think, a very pragmatic approach to this uh, to this problem. When we go to maintenance tests of service age cables, we have uh, the 0.1 hertz 10 delta. Most of the time, to to find basically the global insulation aging condition due to water trees, uh, we have you know the uh, the uh, monitored high pot test uh, where we again lose leakage current. And in this case, we on on service age cable, it makes sense to use the 10 delta because now we're talking about the aging condition. We can also use PD uh, as indicators for trending the test. And we can also obviously use the PD at power frequency. You see, so the, the selection of methods is not is not a huge selection. It's pretty much the same the same methods, but we by applying them in certain situations, we get the information that we are looking for. Uh, this was just a you know the first part, and maybe we we just have a, a brief uh, maybe session for question and answers here because this was pretty much just an overview about. You know what the benefits are of, and what the applications are for, for uh, uh, um, commissioning tests and for uh, maintenance tests. And the, the following part is more about some of the more technical uh, information about the individual methods. So I don't know if there are any questions, uh, Greg. If you if you if you want to. Uh, Yes, uh, someone was asking um, if you can go into more of a definition of, of what is a monitored high pot test. A monitored high pot, you know, a high, let me start back just with a high pot test. A high pot test is a go no go test. It either passes or fails. It's like play, playing Russian roulette. You don't know what the outcome of it is. That's why to have an indicator during the high pot test, what how the cable is reacting to the high pot test is a very welcome uh, addition to it, and that's what we did in the old days when we did leakage current during a DC high pot test. If we saw the leakage current decreasing, we know we knew it was fine. If the leakage current was holding steady, well, there was a problem. And if the leakage current would go up during the high pot test, we knew we would get the cable to fail. So the 
a monitored hypothesis is just doing a hypothesis, but with the addition of having an indicator whether this cable is going to pass well, pass, let's say, at a, well, some concern, or will go, will go bust during the test. And that's what the definition of the monitor hypothesis uh, test is, and it's actually written up also, described in IEEE 400.2. And and I think it offers again compared to a to just the the plain hypothesis test uh, uh, good additional information, which uh, I, that's why I I think a monitored hypothesis test is always to be preferred over a a just a plain hypothesis test. Okay. Any any other questions at this point, or we want to um, we want to. Are there any recommended intervals uh, that tan delta tests can be performed on the cables? At what intervals? Well, it, it depends a little bit. If you look in in IEEE 400.2, there is a uh, a, a action list uh, written uh, written up in in the in the standard. And uh, if you uh, you have three classes, uh, no action, uh, uh, basically. Keep an eye on it and and replace. It's very rough categories. So typically, if you if you if you pass a if you met all the criteria to pass a ten delta test, then most people say I have maybe three four years time before I should revisit this. Uh, if you on the other side get a ten delta result where it says well uh, you should keep an eye on it, then you might want to retest it. Uh, every year, and and most likely after the next year, maybe you see a, a clear uh, deterioration of the cable, which then might put you uh, might make you put this cable on a on a replacement list. So, uh, but you know, if you get a good test, it's typically three four years. It's similar with a you know the the VLF high port test. If you do that, a cable that passes a VLF high port test typically is is. Uh, 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 expected to to uh, to go for three four years without any problems due to the increased aging condition of the insulation. Okay. All right. Uh, we uh, maybe we want to move on. Um, uh, like when you do periodic maintenance tests, the objective is uh, on the cable global aging from water trees, workmanship issues on joints, workmanship issues, um, termination, workmanship issues, you know, which cause PD, and um, and terminations. It's a little different. It's not water trees you're looking so much for, but you know, you have local aging, and you know, you have heat, you have uh, ultraviolet radiation. Uh, that can increase the losses uh, in these in these accessories, you know, creating more leakage and in you know which could co uh, cause failure of of the uh, of the accessory. And then you have the jacket. Obviously, we know all you know if the jacket, you know, sometimes in uh, I have seen it in uh, on wind farms where cables get plowed in, and by plowing in, the whole jacket was stripped off over over. Maybe several hundred feet of cable, so obviously that's not a good situation. Now, when we look at very low frequency AC hypo testing, we have to recognize there are three different applications really. And when people talk about it, we have to be clear what what's meant by it. Okay, to the left we have what we call the workmanship test, and that is really what is the the what does it tell you? It tells you something about your operational integrity. That means I put a splice in, I test the cable, and I can be sure I can switch the cable in without the circuit basically blowing up. Okay, that's what that really means. <clears throat> I can do a, a preventive maintenance uh, test. It, it also gives me basically the, in 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 contrast to the operational integrity. It will give me some operational reliability information because if it if it passes the test as prescribed in 400.2, then it will 
and it passes that test, then it's typically an indication that the aging condition is at a level that allows me to operate this cable for another three or four years before I should retest it. So this is preventive. Now we can go to the predictive maintenance test, <clears throat> which is a monitored or diagnostic type test, and that is basically also giving me insight about the operational reliability of, of the cable. It, you know, all three different applications are driven by their own sets of requirements. And what that means is sets of requirements is test time and test voltage. Okay. And uh, if you look on the next slide, I, I try to, to summarize this here. The test, on the workmanship test, many companies use basically operating voltage uh, for maybe five minutes. And what would it what is the test objective? Substantial workmanship issues in splices and terminations. And what does it mean, really? Cable can be switched in without risk of immediate failure. That's what all this test can do. Compared to the preventive or monitor withstand test is where I have a voltage, the lowest voltage I should ever use is about 1.7. And then that 1.7 comes from the fact if you have a three-phase system and uh, you have one, one phase going, uh, uh, say, faulted, then you might have, depending on the type of three-phase system you have, you might have uh, system voltage between the other two phases. You, you, so you're basically testing for the worst-case scenario here. Okay? And the test time is between 30 and 60 minutes per phase. And what is the test objective? Defects to find defects in splice and termination and the cable installation. And what does it really mean? If a cable system passes this test 60 minutes at this test voltage, there are no substantial defects statistically three to five years for free from aging condition. So you can see it's a it's a big a big big difference between these type of tests and when people say, you know, we do VLF testing, it's very important to understand what type of VLF testing they do. The workmanship test or the, uh, the, the really the true preventive uh, uh, test, which is in essence a condition assessment test. So I think it's always uh, good to understand what happens during the VLF hypo test. Because, you know, when we changed from DC testing to VLF testing, uh, there was obviously a lot of, uh, 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 a lot of people said, well, you know, we should do a very similar like because we have good experience with the DC test. Well, uh, that doesn't work very well because the effects of the AC or the 0.1 hertz uh, AC are very different during the test on the cable installation than that of the DC. Okay, so we have, in the service age cables, we have water trees, and once they reach a critical size, they will be converted to electrical trees, and they will fail. Um, and um, so we can accelerate this by, if we have water trees that have reached a critical size, they will be converted by the high electrical field from the BLF test, two electrical trees, and now these trees grow very rapidly and they will fail. So this is basically you're trying to flush the weak spots out during the VLF test. And, and uh, the time really you use is how long you do the test. Uh, it's a little bit of a compromise between how many test failures you want to see versus in service failures. Uh, it has been proven through through quite a number of data in the in the industry. You know, the, the last data was published by by Neatrack in Atlanta several years ago. Uh, a 60 minute test is is on 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 H cables is a good test time, and uh, it's worth it because you reducing the uh, in service failures. You have more test failures, but you have fewer in-service failures. So, so that's the balance you have to do. And depending on 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 certain, there are some customers uh, that have very spe special network systems, and they might they might opt not to do a 60-minute test, but uh, they might only opt for a 30-minute test.
because they're balancing the time of the the outage time of the of a long feeder versus the uh, the in service failure rate. Okay, so so that can be an argument, but typically. You know, 60 minutes, 15 minutes is way too short. It has proven it's a disaster to do a 15-minute test. At least 30 minutes on H cables, but on on uh, on the better our recommendation is always 60 minutes on on service H cables. Okay, so uh, when you have uh, what happens uh, with the uh, let's say accessories, I call them man-made accessories. They are layered in nature because they have different different types of materials and uh, basically these different type materials have different dielectric properties which create basically a voltage divider across this uh, this installation and if you have air pockets in it that's really what the issue is because typically the field in the air pocket exceeds the breakdown borders of air and you get partial discharge and uh, <clears throat> so uh, uh, that can happen when you put also the the BLF voltage on. Uh, if you reach that critical uh, uh, voltage in in the splice or termination, then you might get a splice failure during that test. The the fact is the first fact is the total number of overall faults, regardless <coughs> whether you uh, you uh, 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 you test or you don't test. It's theoretically the same. It's just that the the question is when do you see these faults? Okay, do you show them as for, uh, FOS, which is basically uh, uh, failure in service, or you see them as as uh, as failure on test? And uh, typically today, I think the thinking is I rather have the cable fail under controlled condition. That means during a planned outage rather than during during in in service when i have no control over it okay it, the other the other important fact is due to the withstand character of the vlf test it cannot generate a fault on its own if a cable fails during a withstand test it only fails because the cable has a defect in the insulation or the accessory already otherwise the test voltage cannot fail the cable, and this has been, you know, has been proven over over many many years. You know, the initial 60 hertz AC test was uh, two per unit, the VLF test is three per unit, and these voltages have been used for many many years and have proven to be uh, very very appropriate. Oh, let me see. Uh, Uh, you, this diagram, you can see the effect. Uh, coming back to the one question I was asked earlier, uh, what happens uh, under under VLF condition to the to the growth of of electrical trees? This chart shows you the the growth rate. And look at the yellow and the the, the yellow and the red one right now. This is 0.1 hertz, the two technologies that are out in the field: sinus and cosine rate, angular technologies. And you see the growth rate. On the on the vertical axis in millimeters per hour versus the test voltage level, and you can see at three per unit these uh, and this is all RMS values. You can see roughly at three per unit test voltage you have a 10 millimeter per hour growth rate on electrical trees. Where if you go to to uh, the green curve, which is 50 or 60 hertz, uh, you you have maybe one third of it, okay, and uh, you can see at 60 hertz the behavior is very almost linear from one, you know, at at, at operating voltage to two times operating voltage to three points operating voltage, but then it takes off very quickly, and that's the reason why when you do power frequency test, any type of power frequency test, you you don't want to come close to that point. Because that can really create a domino effect in your cable. That's why we also, I said earlier, when we do power, uh, when we do uh, PD testing at power frequency, we normally don't want to exceed the two per unit level, okay? Because otherwise, you can get in a in a in a, in a runaway situation. What you also can see on this slide 
if you look at the purple curve, that is a 0 0.01 hertz frequency. And many times that question is asked, you know, well, maybe we can we can do a 0 0.01 hertz because we have a really long cable and our our tester cannot cannot charge this cable at 0 0.1 hertz. But what you really see is the growth rate of the electrical tree is totally different. It's almost you can say a factor 10 slower. So that means if you have a long and a short cable, and you test in the same way with the same with the same with the same equipment, but you use the short cable at 0.1 hertz, and you test the the long cable at 0.01 hertz. The 0.01 hertz, the, that long cable will always look much better because the stress is totally different. You cannot really compare 0.01 hertz testing to 0.1 hertz testing. That is why also IEEE recognizes this. They don't close entirely the door on it, but they say it is questionable what it really means when you get results, and there are no no results to compare to, so uh, they basically uh, uh, give the advice to pretty much stay with the 0.1 hertz. Uh, the situation in Europe is a little different. There, in the standard, it only allows 0.1 hertz. It doesn't even allow 0.01 hertz. So, just as, but here you can see there is a difference, and and the notion that it doesn't make a difference is incorrect because something totally different happens in the cable installation at these two different frequencies. Uh, this is a, a, let me just click a few times on here. This is just to show you, okay, now I went one too far, okay, this is it. Just to, to visualize what's really, what does it look like when you look at a cable that has water trees in it, okay? And you can see you have, uh, you know, here where I have my mouse, you have small water trees from the outside in. And you can also have water trees growing from the inside out. And outside in means you have somewhere a problem in the jacket, you have water ingress and you get moisture in. When you have typically from the inside out, that means maybe the cable had water between the strands when it was installed because you know it was not kept off or whatever. You had you had moisture present or water present, and uh, it always starts the growth of the water trees. Always starts to grow. It starts to grow at the interface between the insulation and the semicon layer, because that is where the biggest uh, dielectric stress initially is. You can also see trees, the electrical field at the con or near the conductor is always bigger than the one near the screen. So the, the same effect can grow faster from the inside out than from the outside in because of that higher electrical field. And uh, then you see here, this is, for instance, a, what we call a water tree of a critical size because it has already crossed about a good three quarter of the insulation. And these are the, the types of water trees. When you do the VLF test, they will get converted to electrical tree and now grow very rapidly and grow to failure. Where this small water tree was at that high voltage test level of the, the VLF test will not do anything. It just sits there because the electrical field is much, much smaller at its tip compared to the electrical field here. And that's really the combination of the electrical field created by the water tree itself and the superimposed electrical field from the test voltage that make the conversion. And that's why, you know, the small trees are not affected, but that's why we say a service H cable where you have this tree and you do a VLF test, you bring it to fruition. Once this is done, you have these small ones, and the small ones are small today, but in three or four years, they could have reached a longer length and become now a critical thing, and that's why you might want to retest the cable after so much time. This is just to show you the, the different growth of, of electrical trees at different frequencies, you know, on the left side you see 50, 60 hertz. This is a lab laboratory experiment, and on the right side you see it at 0.1 hertz. You know, on the on the at 50, 60 hertz, electrical trees grow like tumbleweeds. Okay, where and you see in the end it fails, and you see the discharge channel here. But when you look at the 0.1 hertz, you don't get the tumbleweed. You get a very directional, uh, very fast 
uh, growth of the electrical tree at 0.1 hertz. And that's, like I said, is beneficial because it accelerates this, uh, this, this effect. So, so uh, two types of hypo testing, withstand testing, step testing. What is the purpose of withstand testing? That's basically detection and elimination of local degradation. It's a non-destructive. I, I want to emphasize this. A withstand test is a non-destructive test. The cable might fail, but it fails because it has a defect. And that is in, in stark contrast to when we look at a step test, which is also a hypo test. That is the determination of the true aging condition of the cable. And obviously, it's always a destructive test because I have to test it till failure. And that's why it's really important to 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 recognize the difference. A a a, a high pot test, according to IEEE four hundred point two, is a non-destructive test because the fact that I apply it is not automatically failing the cable unless it has a problem. Whether the the step test will always fail the cable. Uh, this is uh, I I think we we jump over this. Uh, uh, this is an interesting slide because it shows the the uh, the uh, the breakdown strength of uh, of cables without def let's say without water trees and regarding uh, compared to with water trees as a function of the frequency. Uh, what you can see is this is the VLF. The green is the the uh, the uh, what well, the VLF is here. Point one. You can see be point one. Be the difference between cables with water trees and cables that have no water trees, the breakdown strength is a huge difference. Where if you go to 60 hertz, that difference is much smaller. So why is this important? Because some people are concerned. They say, well, if I test the cable with a VLF, don't I weaken the cable? And you can see here, if you have no water trees, you're not really weakening it because you would need so much more voltage to make it fail compared to when you have it. So and this is in contrast to the 60 hertz, where that difference is much, much smaller. So a, a, a good cable versus a bad cable, so to speak, a, a, you, might, you might inflict much easier damage to a, a, a test at 60 hertz than you would do at 0.1 hertz. Uh, one of the withstand tests, I said, you know, we can use a leakage current depending on the voltage we, or the, the technology we use on the cosine rate angular, which looks basically like a, you can say, like a 60 hertz transition with a plateau phase of five seconds, another 60 hertz transition. We can measure leakage current at the, at the end of the plateau phase. And in contrast to when we have a sinusoidal VLF test, we cannot measure leakage current. Um, it, we move on to the to the tan delta testing. Uh, uh, you know, space tan delta is an indication. The increase in tan delta is an indication of the aging condition of the cable. And uh, and uh, basically, because you increase in the dielectric losses, the tan delta is similar to the power factor testing on transformers where we look at the power factor. Here we look at the loss angle on cables. So they are created, the losses are created by the deterioration of insulation. And so that's what the 10 delta will tell us. And again, it's very different when you look at the frequency. If you would do a 60 hertz 10 delta test, the effect is much, much smaller than at 0.1 hertz. That's why it's really important to do 10 delta testing for aging condition at 0.1 hertz. And to do this, we need a sinusoidal wave shape. We cannot use a cosine rate angular wave shape for, for, for 10 delta testing. And uh, this is just, you know, the showing you the, the uh, this is the loss angle here. And so basically, you know, when you do power factor tests, you look at this angle, and we look for cable testing. We look at this angle. Obviously, it's basically the uh, the ratio of the resistive and the capacitive losses, and uh, and so if the aging takes place, we get more and more resistive losses. That's why the ten delta goes up. This is just a a a, a slide to show you uh, the difference between different aged cables and the effect of the 10 delta tip-up. 
So we have here, we have actually here six voltage points, 0.5, 1, 1.5, 2, 2.5, or 5. And so if we do on a brand new cable, you see we get a flat line. And that means there is no, basically no, nothing we can pick up in terms of aging. And the, the tip up is really the delta 10 delta in IEEE is defined between the difference between the value at 0.5 and 1.5. And here you can see there is no tip up, right? If we go to the other extreme, strongly serviced H cable number four, you see here the tip up between 0.5 and 1.5 is substantial. And that's pretty much, and in between you have different degrees of aging. There's also something that, that uh, you can see here. Uh, when you see the jump of the 10 delta, uh, it's, it's, this is something very that, that should be noticed. Because you could also have a, let's say, a linear increase from here to here. And that would mean that it's normally much better to see than a jump. Because a jump always suggests something is changing drastically. And for instance, what could change drastically, the losses, if you get to a point where you ionize a problem in the cable, for instance, then you get an avalanche effect. and your 10 delta or your leakage current would jump up. Whenever you have a jump up in a cable, there is a, a good possibility that you're dealing with something uh, of a PD nature in it, and that's what creates this, this, this jump. If you had a cable that it has maybe a much higher 10 delta, but has a very nice linear slope to it, that is normally a less endangered cable than the cable like that you see here in the blue in the blue, uh, 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 marked as blue. So uh, when you do look at 10 delta testing, it, it can be done in, in, in various ways. You can have external 10 delta equipment. You can have internal 10 delta equipment. Uh, and the, the typically most equipment today goes clearly towards the internal because it's a whole lot easier in the field to, to apply. And uh, uh, only if you would really require very, very high precision type measurements where you also have to look at the, the leakage current over the terminations, there is a way to do this, but it's a very, and it's just shown here, it's a very, uh, let's say, <laughs> uh, I don't want to say cumbersome, but it's more involved method. It can be done. It's almost like you're using guard rings in the, in the field, okay? And for the typical measurement, it's not required. Also, typically, we're not needing that type of a precision measurement. You will see the numbers in IEEE 400.2 uh, that are basically the, the, the performance criteria are not really very tight. They are, they have some, some, uh, uh, the, they are all in a magnitude of 10 to the minus 3. So when I talk about leakage here, then I want to go down to 10 to the minus 4, which is not required according to IEEE. So that's why basically nobody will do this type of a measurement in the field. Summary of the uh, 0.1 hertz uh, method, it's an effective, it's very effective uh, to use by construction crews to substitute for the DC high pot test, basically as a workmanship test to check for operational integrity. Uh, it is a very effective withstand test to detect low and high resistive local defects, and that's important to, to recognize, low and high. Low would be, for instance, a really bad water tree, because it creates a low resistive path in the in the cable installation, or it could be a high resistive path, which is basically a void or a, a, a you know basically a, a, a air bubble in the installation that that will pop. Um, so in that regard, if you do it as a withstand test with the right voltage levels with the right time, then it becomes really a test to. It is an indication of the operational reliability. And, um, you know, it can be also used as a monitor withstand test, like I said, with either leakage current or dielectric factor or PD level. And, uh, and basically assessing the condition of the cable insulation during the test. 
when we come to partial discharge testing, it, it, it's probably, uh, it, it has also become much more, let's say, uh, usable in the, as a field testing method over the past 10 years. It has a little bit the, the you know, the, uh, the uh, many times the opinion is voiced, well, it's too complicated to do it. Actually, when you look at equipment today, it has become much, much easier to use and also much, much easier to interpret. But there is no doubt that partial discharge is basically the, the, the more, sometimes the more difficult to interpret, okay? That's where I always say a, a, a good withstand test, especially a monitor withstand test, is a good test because it fails or it's good, okay? You don't have to interpret. In certain situations, that's very welcome. If you if you have to do the diagnostic test, with the diagnostic test comes always the interpretation. And and many times it's it's fairly easy to interpret, but there are also those situations where you might not be able to interpret anything. But this is typically only in maybe five percent of the cases. What do you see here in joints and terminations? You see this is a paper cable, and you can see how nice these electrical trees can grow between the layers of paper. This is very typical, a very typical paper cable where you see, you know, you see partial discharge here. This is uh, XLP cable. You can see, you can actually see the, the pattern of the, how the, the insulation was stripped off with the, uh, with, the, with the tool over the knife and, you know, creating undercuts in the insulation and then creating voice when you, when you, when you put the other materials over, and that's where you get the partial discharge. So um, you can also, partial discharge can be, a, in some instances, very rare instances, can be also showing you a manufacturing defect in a cable, like in this one, where you can see it's missing the semicon in certain spots in the cable. And there is no way you would ever find this with any withstand test. The only way to find it was a PDE test because you will find PDE in this cable because there is no semicon between the conductor and the, and the insulation. So, but it's a very rare case. You know, in terms of standards, we have, you know, we have uh, on the one side, we have in Europe, we have a lot of the VDE standards, which are now the CE or the IEC standards, and we have IEEE standards, and most common in the United States, the 400.2, and uh, obviously, for this is for VLF testing, and then we have also the 400.3 for the, for, the, uh, for the PD testing in the field. And there are also some of the IEC standards, like 60 to 70, which also is applicable to to how to make PD measurements in the field. And uh, so it's always important to recognize the the standards that apply, and also uh, if uh, if you use different methods to make sure, so you can compare what some of the results might be. You know, if you compare, for instance. Uh, partial discharge test results from different manufacturers, you want to make sure that they follow the same standards because otherwise that's not possible. Causes for PD in paper cable, you can see if you have a dry out in the paper cable because of loss of oil, that the paper is basically not an insulator, so you get a lot of partial discharge you know, in dried out paper cables. It, you know, you, uh, you can um, <coughs> You can get, if you have water ingress, which is the other uh, major cause for, for uh, paper cables to fail, so basically you you basically shorting out part of the insulation by the, by the moisture ingress, which means you're increasing the stress in the other areas of the cable, which it can increase it to the, to the point that it fails, okay? And um, here is basically a drawing of what I showed you before in that photo, how you can see carbonized PD tracks between the layers, okay? And that's when you have PD in paper cables and you, you uh, want to repair them, you have many times you have to peel the tape back to where you cannot find it anymore. So it could be could be over quite some several meters, okay, where you have to, or, or several, inch, uh, several feet where you have to uh, redo the insulation. In XLP cables, you know, we have an older 
XLP cables, which were not as well quality controlled as they are today. You know, we had maybe inclusions for an objects. Whenever you have that in a cable, you increasing the stress, the dielectric uh, or the electrical field at that point, and that creates more stress in the insulation, which ultimately will create issues to the insulation. You might have impurities, you might have voids, you might have, this is a very, very, uh, bad situation when you have delamination between the insulation and the semicon. That means if you bend the cable too too uh, too strongly, then you know the insulation will will separate from the semicon, and you might get an air pocket in between, and that's basically the end of the cable. Okay. Uh, you know, we we have uh, several uh, uh, parameters that we that we looking at. Uh, when we do partial discharge testing, one of the one of the parameters is the the uh, the PD inception voltage, and that is basically the voltage at what voltage level the PD will start to show up. If it starts already below, if it's present below operating voltage, that is bad news because that means that cable has constant PD, and if it's an XLP cable, <coughs> it's just a matter of time till it will fail. If it's a paper cable, it can live with it for quite some time because you have the oil present and the oil will basically snuff the PD out. Um, in, uh, here you can see also that the inception voltage uh, is depending on the frequency. That's why I mentioned PD testing a power frequency is today very common, but also PD testing at 0.1 hertz. There is nothing wrong with 0.1 hertz PD testing. However, the results especially might be different when you look at splices and terminations because the inception voltage might be higher than at operating voltage, uh, hertz, which could give you a false, a false, uh, uh, say, uh, feeling of security that there is and so um, uh, uh, when you go to power frequency, these issues can be avoided. So our recommendation, we offer, you know, we offer as a manufacturer both both methods, but, you know, from a technical point, we always, we always recommend to do partial discharge testing at power frequency. Here you can see, <coughs> actually, if you use this particular type of partial discharge testing at power frequency, you can see this allows you to see the, the inception and the extinction voltage at the same time. This is what we call the damped AC technology. And you can see the damped AC, you see the AC wave as it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And if you see the PD, you see PD here, that's the inception voltage. And you can see here beyond this point, you don't have any PD, so this is the extinction voltage. If you, if this is possible because you only give a very short voltage application to the cable compared to a continuous voltage application. If you do continuous voltage application, then obviously you you cannot see extinction and, and inception voltage at the same time. You have to 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 run different tests to to approach that level either on the upside or the downside. Extinction voltage is also very important because, unfortunately, partial discharge has what we call a hysteresis behavior. That means the inception voltage and extinction voltage are not identical. So as you raise the voltage, you get inception. As you decrease the voltage from the inception level, it, the, it will not extinguish at the same level, but typically at a lower level than what the inception was. So what people really look for when they do PD testing, that the extinction level is above operating voltage, because otherwise that means you have now constant PD on your cable. And why this is important is when you do PD testing, you always want to test, uh, let's say, at a somewhat higher voltage than operating voltage to simulate maybe a switching surge and to see whether a switching surge could, could create PD that would persist at lower than operating voltage levels. For the most part, we recommend 1.2, 1.3. Uh, you not for this. 
and uh, that will normally be good enough to see whether it, or to make sure that your extinction level is still above operating waters. Uh, this is an interesting uh, uh, or very important interesting uh, uh, fact uh, because I think many of you probably have looked at uh, online versus offline testing and you know both have their pluses and minuses but uh, this particular aspect of checking the cable for switching surges I cannot do when I do an online test because I can never exceed my operating waters that is on on that side is a negative but obviously there are some positives for online testing as well but so it all depends what the what the objective is what you like to learn about the cable uh, condition and the cable health is the, that determines what type of test method you use. Here is just a quick slide to show you the same splice um, uh, tested at 50 basic power frequency PD test with this 0.1 hertz PD test and you can see the inception world is, is substantially different it's less it's more than two times and we're here at 50 hertz, it shows you it's less than operating voltage, so you, you should be concerned where if you would run the same test on the same slice at, uh, at 0.1 hertz, you would get a much higher double the operating voltage, which would tell you uh, you don't have to be concerned. So that's why we, we, we think, uh, you know, uh, from a technical perspective, the, uh, the uh, PD testing at operating voltage for splices and terminations is the technically better choice. Localization of PD, like I said, this is a one big plus point of, of PD testing because it can localize where the problem is. And pretty much it works with the same, the same way as on a TDR measurement. You have a pulse. It, it travels, you know, back to, from its origin here is the origin of the PD. It travels back to the, to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, near end of the cable and part of the pulse will go to the end, gets reflected, comes back. And based on the, on the timing difference between the two pulses and the propagation velocity in the cable, you can, you can calculate the, uh, the location of this PD. This is how it's done. And you can see here, it, uh, this is the original pulse, basically, as it's received here. And this is a reflected pulse. And you can see the reflected pulse is attenuated and dispersed like any pulse would be. The cable acts like a filter, almost like a bandpass filter, to the pulse. And that's also what, if you have an extremely long cable, can sometimes lead to the fact that you cannot localize anymore because you cannot get the second pulse anymore because it is attenuated to the point it's done. It's gone. So uh, th there are some limitations in terms of localization on cable links. Um, this is just to show you uh, a couple of field results here. Uh, you know, I have one little issue here. I cannot see the full size of my screen here because I have this <laughs> from the webinar, that <laughs> the window in here. But uh, I'm just guessing here right now. I mean, this was a, you can see this better. Uh, 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 but you see you have quite a bit of partial discharge uh, 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 on this on this cable here and uh, the the this is just to show you the PD as a function of the uh, of the damped AC voltage what you really want to know in the end is you want to know where's the partial discharge okay let me just see if something happened Okay, and this is what we call the mapping chart. That takes this information, and what what it does, it it maps it now, and you can see. And this is really the the valid in or the, the the benefit of this information. It shows you where the PD is, at what level the PD is, and you can see here at 200 meters and 350 meters you have PD. It shows you which phase it is in L1, L2, L3, and many times you see in a three-phase circuit that you have maybe one splice and one phase that's bad and at, at the same splice the other phases uh, uh, are not affected by it okay so but that's really what you like to know and you based on the PD level which is pretty substantial here uh, you know you might make the decision to say well uh, I can I can uh, I can eliminate that by 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 replacing the splice and this is where the 
the combination really of the partial discharge test and the 10 delta test come in. Because if you have done a 10 delta test, which shows the aging condition for this very cable to be still in a reasonable range, so you can say, yeah, I can get another 10, 15 years out of the cable, but I have PD in these two spots. So by replacing the splices, you can basically return this cable to a, a, a reasonable health status, okay? So uh, for 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 a service age cable, the combination of PD testing and 10 delta testing is a very valid uh, approach because it gives you all the information you need to 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 know what to do with this cable, whether you need to replace it, whether you can you know repair it or whatever the, the case might be. Um, these are more, I think, in we we have to come to a to a close here. It's just to show you here, uh, you know, uh, 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 important uh, uh, aspect of PD testing. I can do PD testing in in mixed cables. So many many cables in network systems in downtown areas are mixed cables between paper and EPR and paper and XRP and and maybe all three together. And uh, I didn't mention it when we talked about the 10 delta testing. The 10 delta testing you can only do on one type of cable. You cannot do it on a mixed cable because the, 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 the dielectric losses for different installations are different. So if you have XLP and, and paper combined, the, the higher losses in the paper, which are my, might be still tolerable, might overshadow a really bad situation on the XLP cable. So that's why it's not possible to really do this. With the PD you can do it and this is interesting to see here because you see you have the transition splice and typically in the, the on the right side you will see the paper and you can see PD and paper is not uncommon actually when it comes from the factory many paper cables have PD but you, they can live with it at, at low levels for, for many, many, many years. Where on the other side, you have basically the XLP part, and there the PD is much more cumbersome. But you also don't have much much PD there. So it is typically when you have a mixed cables and you have a transition splice, you can see the left to the transition splice in the XLP section, you have basically no PD. Because if you had PD at the same levels, you would never be able to find it because the cable would have failed by the time you would you would see that level of PD. Because remember, the PD levels in, in XRP cables are probably becoming dangerous over 20, when you have more than 20 picocoulombs. The factory test requires five or less picocoulombs for, for XRP cables, where in a paper cable you can have a several hundred picocoulombs and it's fine, it lasts for years. That's really why most people agree that partial discharge testing on XRP cables, for the most part, is really there to find problems and splices and terminations. And there's a number out in the industry, 85% of RPD measured in these type cables is in splices and terminations. And the other 15% is, let's say, to some extent questionable what really is cable PD because in the field, it is very difficult to measure really low-level PD like you can do in a factory, okay, because of all the ambient noise you have. Okay, here you can see this is this is pretty pretty interesting that this was a XLP ca uh, cable, I th I think, but you know, was right in the in the joint. I mean, like uh, you know, there's nothing in the cable, but the joint is a bad, really bad bad joint. Here you have a, a, uh, a another. Uh, this was apparently a, a paper cable, and you can see the the joint. And this is basically just PD in the paper. But you know you can see by far this is the worst, and this is where the where the splice is. You can see here the splice is actually where you have the black dots. These are the splice locations, and you know you can say well that splice also seems to have maybe. Some some issue here, but uh, these other ones are not too bad. But uh, but this is really a bad one. 
So uh, the mapping is really, this is a big advantage of the PD method. I can do the mapping. I can see where the PD is. I can see the level, and I can take action based on that. And, uh, you know, many people always say, you know, what are the numbers? And the numbers you have to take with a grain of salt, okay? And, and I think this is expressed in this cable. You know, we have here a cable element. Uh, you know, the insulation joints, terminations, and we have different types, you know, and we have a trend and limit, okay? If you look for, for let's say, for a, a joint, you know, you have an oil field joint, you can see I can tolerate, you know, 10,000 picocoulombs, no problem. I go to a silicone, to a, to a dry joint, I, I, I'm down to 500 to 1,000 picocoulombs, right? You go to the cable, Paper cable, 10,000, XLP, less than 20 picocoulombs. These are just basically ballpark figures because the, the issue is if I have, for instance, a joint or termination, it might even depend on the manufacturer who made it, what these levels are. They can vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. So uh, that is a little bit the, the, say, when you start PD testing, initially, you need to build up some knowledge base about your your components, and then you know there are some databases available that you can compare stuff to, but uh, it, this is you know where really the difference is in interpretation, what it means, uh, you know when you when you compare cables to each other or different type cables especially, and different types of accessories, and. Um, Decision making XLP cables. If you have a new cable, it should be PD free. Okay. The the uh, uh, if you have an aged an aged joint termination, you should have at operating voltage less than a thousand picocoulomb. Okay. And uh, and uh, you can see also here the question also came up: How often do I have to do any testing? This is basically also a little bit of a guideline to say, you know, how often you do you should do it based on what the condition during the PD test is. If it's PD free, you might wait, you know, 10 years. If you have a PD IV, which is partial discharge inception voltage at lower than U naught every year. If you have it, you know, in this range, maybe every two to three years. But you know, you will you will develop that based on the information that you get from your own cable population. Here you you know basically the numbers I share with you, you know, eighty eighty five percent you can see your cables cable uh, cable joints and terminations eighty five percent and um, and you can see PDIV the the purple is P D activity up to U naught. So that's already below Below you not, you know, in half of what, what people have tested, and this is for paper cables, okay? We have a similar chart that might be more, more uh, 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 applicable for, for uh, uh, XLP. This should be the XLP chart, but you see this one doesn't, doesn't change. No, this is the same, I think, actually. You see, I thought I had one slide. No, I don't have it. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought I had a slide. What does it say on the right side of the slide? Does it say XLP or does it say paper cable, PIC cable? I cannot see that because it's covered up, but the numbers seem to be the same as on the previous slide. And you know, this was actually accumulated by a, a, a utility company in in the Netherlands. And I have to say, the Netherlands, even as a very small country, they have done a ton of PD testing. They have a lot of lot of test results, and the reason is because they have a very strict system for outages. If they have an outage longer than I think 10 minutes. They have to pay the end user automatically a fine. Okay, so the consumer gets money paid for any outage over 10 minutes. So it's really an incentive system. You pay the fine, or you spend some money on on testing to avoid it. So you know, it's it might be not a bad bad system, but that's what they have, and that's why they did a lot of testing in the Netherlands. This is just a brief overview about different types of equipment that we use. With this PD testing, 10 delta testing, VLF testing, and uh, this is you know PD testing on transmission cables. So uh, uh, 
And but as summary, to conduct a successful cable test program, the important thing is what is the goal of the test program? You must identify that. Is it reliability assessment or is it wholesale replacement? Because the the, the, the strategies are different. If I'm looking for I have a lot of old XLP cable, you know, maybe bare concentric wire, I must replace it or all. I know that. But I have to find the right sequence to do it so I can spend my replacement dollars. So really I'm only interested in the in the aging condition of the cable because if I have a splice, a bad splice, I can always fix it. It doesn't affect the aging condition. However, if I'm really interested in reliability, maybe an important cable <coughs> to an industrial plant or to a hospital, I must look at both. I must look at the aging condition of the cable and at the local condition of the cable, which 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 are typically totally unrelated to each other. So I have to do two tests. And those two tests today are typically 10 delta test and NPD test. I must look at my cable population to determine what what do I what must I test because you cannot test all the cables and that that uh, you know will take some analysis of your of your cable population. <coughs> It's always nice if you have a fault database, so uh, where you know, you know, a certain cable, you know, how many failures you had, and really, it's a it's a very good thing if you if it's not available, but you know, start. It's a good thing to start doing it to to do a cable test, uh, a cable fault uh, database, and separate it by accessory failures versus cable failures. Because that is really a clear indication whether you have more workmanship issue or you have a cable aging problem. And uh, then you, based on, on those objectives, you must identify the, the, the test methods. And um, <clears throat> like I say, certain global test methods cannot apply to all cables. In, and they can never be applied to uh, to mixed cables. Where, you know, this is the advantage of the high pot test and the PD test. I can apply them to mixed cables as well. So that's basically as a summary. And um, I think now we can open the discussion for, for questions. All right, thank you, Henning. Um, at this time, the uh, webinar is officially concluded, but we're going to stay online for probably another 10 minutes and uh, continue the Q&A session. Um, if you have any questions, please submit them now in the Q&A box. For those of you that are leaving, when you close the webinar window, a survey should pop up on the screen. We would greatly appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to provide your feedback so we can continue to improve future webinars. A copy of the presentation will be emailed to you in the next few days, and a recording of this session will be available on our website at megacom forward slash webinars in the next two weeks. Our webinar landing page also contains a schedule for all upcoming webinars and recordings of all our previous webinars. Um, if you're looking for any webinar rela related information, you can again visit megacom forward slash webinars. Now let's go on to the questions. Uh, Henning, the first question we have is, what are the differences between using cosine or sine testing waveforms? Well, <clears throat> if you if you uh, the difference one is a sinusoidal wave shape and the other one is basically a combination of a power frequency and a five second DC test but a five second DC test not a long term DC test and the advantage of this how it was created why did we create this wave shape this was the first VLF wave shape that was uh, commercially available in back in the 80, in 1987 because it has one uh, one big advantage over the sinusoidal. The stress you have during the test equals the stress under operating conditions because the polarity transition is made at a 60 hertz rate. The other advantage of this wave shape is that the test voltage is the peak test voltage is exactly the same as if you would apply 60 hertz AC because that's two per unit, so the peak is approximately three per unit. And 
for the cosine rectangular, the peak and the RMS voltage are the same. That's why the test voltage does not exceed the test voltage of the 60 hertz. That's what this wave shape combines. So it's the stress level is the same, and the, the maximum peak voltage is the same that you use. You, you don't go any higher. The, the uh, uh, one other advantage of that wave shape is it can test typically higher cable capacitance because uh, in its design, it's almost designed like a resonant type test set. The, 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 the energy you need to charge in this, you, you charge the cable within basically uh, on the cosine rate angle within, uh, what's it, four milliseconds, right? So to do this, you would need either a huge power supply. That's why 60 hertz AC testing is very unpopular because you need a substation to do it. In this case, since we have a resonant test system, we don't, once we have charged the cable, that energy is not dumped. It is retained, converted from electric energy to magnetic energy and can be reused to, to charge the opposite polarity cycle. So we have a couple losses, but so the energy is there to, to afford a very rapid change. And because we have the energy available from, we can also test longer cables. When we go to the sinusoidal wave shape, it has the advantage it can do 10 delta testing, which we cannot do with the cosine rate angular. But it is because I have now a, the stress level is very different compared to 60 hertz because I have, instead of changing polarity within 5 milliseconds or 8 milliseconds, I change polarity within 5 seconds. So a thousand times slower. So the reversal of plus to my, or negative to positive or vice versa happens 1,000 times slower than under power frequency. So the stress level is very different. And uh, uh, the, the test voltage level uh, in, is there, so there is, this becomes very, very uh, let's say, uh, detailed now. Uh, in, in Europe, they use they always specify, regardless of wave shape, they, regard, they, they specify RMS voltage. And if you use RMS voltage, you can see if I use 3 per unit, unit RMS on a, on a sinusoidal, my peak voltage is 4.2. So the peak voltage is higher when I use a sinusoidal, uh, but it makes up basically for the lower stress level during the polarity reversal. Where if we go to the IEEE standard, it makes a peak voltage for sinusoidal, and it specifies RMS for cosine rate angular, and that makes it difficult because now you're comparing peak testing, peak test, uh, peak voltage test levels to RMS test voltage levels, which we all know you can really not do. So the results are somewhat different. It, it, it's, I think, a fair statement to say from a purely withstand test level, this cosine rate angular wave shape delivers a harder punch because it is almost like like your power frequency. Where for 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 uh, uh, diagnostic testing, especially 10 delta testing, it is a very good wave shape. So that and you know, depending on the length of cables, there might be also a a preference for the for the one or the other wave shape, okay? So that's the difference. They, they are different, and if you understand the differences, it's not difficult to live with both of them. It's fine. But uh, you cannot necessarily compare the two on a on a one-to-one -one level. All right, Henning. Uh, another question we received was um, that the presentation focused mostly on XLPE cables. Are these yes. test principles that exactly applicable to EPR insulated cables as well? Yes, yes, yes. It, it's just the, the, the only reason why, you know, uh, the, the emphasis is not really on, on, on EPR because worldwide EPR cable is only really used in, in North America and in, I think, one country in Europe. And all the rest of the world is all XLP cables. So 
the amount of test data you have is so much more on XLP cable and old paper cable compared to EPR cable. That's the only reason. But the methods will actually in IEEE 400.2, there are even tables in there or suggestions for 10 delta testing of EPR cable. And you know, EPR cable is very different compared to XLP cable in one regard. It is a blend of materials, and different manufacturers use different blends. So if you have EPR cable from one manufacturer, it doesn't mean that if you have from a different manufacturer, it will behave the same way. Where if you have XRP cable, XRP cable, the compound, the virgin polyethylene is all the same by, by used by the same comp compound by all manufacturers, okay? So they always have to keep that in mind that EPR doesn't mean it's the same EPR. Okay. Uh, another question is, do you recommend doing both online and offline PD? And if so, why? Well, it, it, if you do online PD, it, it, you have to be, I think there are many more limitations put on online PD uh, uh, because the, uh, the uh, let's say, if you, if you just would have a, a five kilometer cable and you want to do online PD, uh, you probably will never see, unless in the in the very first section of the cable, you might see some PD, but the further you go out, you wouldn't see PD. Typically, online PD is, is good if you have a manhole system, and you can go in the manholes, you can put basically PD detectors around each splice and check, check your splices. That is an advantage, so you can do it online, and you know, but also where you get the signal from online versus offline is very different because the online, I have always to get the PD signal out of the basically concentric neutral or the return, high voltage return. Where the, the, on, the on, on the offline testing, I get the signal from the conductor, okay? So the PD signal from the conductor. So uh, uh, both methods have their, again, have their pluses and minuses. You know, many people think online is great because I don't have to eat the energize, and that's certainly a big advantage. But that advantage comes with a limited amount of information you can get out of an online test, which is not the same as an offline test. Okay. Um, another question is, if low frequency accelerates water tree growth, how can it not weaken the cable insulation? Well, low, uh, low voltage... A, a VLF voltage, I said, you know, it only accelerates, it doesn't accelerate water tree growth. It accelerates electrical tree growth. So, what you have in the installation, you have water trees. If you convert the water tree to electrical tree, now it will grow on the VLF very fast. The VLF frequency will not grow the water trees. It will not. The water tree has, has grown under 60 hertz over the life of the cable or, you know, number of years. So that's why I showed that, that cross section of the cable where I showed small water trees that are totally unaffected by the, by the VLF frequency or test voltage. But if you have a fully grown water tree, it will not grow. It will be converted to an electrical tree and then it will grow fast. So there's a differentiation. It's not that the water tree grows, it is the, you convert to electrical tree, and the electrical tree is really what grows and creates the failure in the cable. Um, is there a limitation to these testing methods if the cable is short? Well, uh, uh, I mean, any hypo test you can do is fine, okay? That, that you can do a <laughs> one foot cable if you want it, if you don't get flash over at the ends. But, but the, the the biggest limitation in length is really from the uh, PD test. Uh, you can do on a very short cable, you can do a PD test and you will see you have PD or no PD, but you cannot localize it. Because like I was explaining, the method you're using to localize, you're looking for the timing difference between two pulses. If you have a very short piece of cable, the timing difference becomes so small, there is no timing difference. And that's then you cannot localize anymore. I would say in a, in the real world, you normally have never have that case happening. I think you would have to be, let's say, less than maybe 
50 feet to not be able to look. If you have 50 feet or more, I think you can localize. It's easier to localize if you have more longer, longer cable, but 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 I'm saying you 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 can do do something, but there is a limit. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can these tests apply to low low voltage cable, 600 volts? Well, <clears throat> all these test methods always require that I can apply a voltage across the insulation. That means typically I need a a coax type cable, whether it's a coax cable or whether it's a shield a shielded cable. Let me put it this way, right? Because I have the potential applied between the conductor across the insulation and the shield is at, at ground potential. If I don't have this, then it becomes basically a problem to test low voltage cables. Because low voltage cables are typically unshielded cables. So all hmm? The methods we okay, discussed today are not applicable to low voltage cables. Um, is DC high pot testing still a recommended type of test to use on cables to determine the overall condition? Well, the only the only uh, uh, application for DC high pot test, according to IEEE, is for paper cables or for laminated cables. Let me be very clear: laminated cables could be paper, could be also foil foil type cables, but laminated cables, not solid dielectric. All solid dielectric tables are to be tested by VLF 0.1 hertz. <clears throat> okay. Um, can you comment on why there might be a tip down during a tan delta test? Sometimes you have a tip down and typically it can be it can be a situation where you have moisture in the cable. <clears throat> That is one of the, when you have, instead of a tip up, you have a tip down. That is something that, that people should, should uh, uh, look at, okay? That you, and we just, that, that's, I think, the most common explanation for that. Okay. Um, what equipment and or software are you using for PD measurement on page 44 to page 46 of your slides? Well, that is a, a damped AC technology, and I mean the software. That is all you know. Any any manufacturer making PD equipment has a proprietary software. A very basically, it's a evaluation software, right? To 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 do all the math that's required to uh, to do the mapping and to do the analysis. So those softwares are not uh, uh, let's say common. Available softwares or commercially available softwares, unless you buy it together, you know they come together with the test set. But this is point one. This is basically uh, damped. For the most part, we're using for power frequency. We're using damped AC uh, uh, as a as a generator to create this the wave shape, the 60 hertz or 50 50 hertz. Well, I should say power frequency because because it's also a, a type of resonance test. Uh, the, the the actual test frequency will depend on the capacitance of the cable because we're using a fixed inductor in our circuit, and you know this this frequency should be between 20 and 300 hertz, which is considered power frequency uh, range. All right, Hayden, we're going to uh, answer one more question before we close it out. Is there any temperature correction factor on cables when performing tan delta? Well, that's a good question. I mean, tan delta is certainly uh, uh, temperature dependent, <clears throat> and uh, that's why it's always uh, uh, the, the the best approach is uh, to to have the same sequence of events when you do a test. So you deanalyze the cable, you let it sit maybe for a couple of hours, or you, you do right away a test. So And you do it maybe at the same time of the year, even, you know, pretty much once you have a buried cable, it, it, the temperature of the cable doesn't change that much with the, with the, uh, uh, from, from winter to summer. But it's obviously between being energized and being offline, Makes a heck of a difference. So you want to you want to make sure that you you test the same cable at at pretty much the same type of scenario. 
All right. It looks like this is all we have time for. If we did not get to your question, we will follow up with you offline to make sure we get it answered. Uh, thank you all for attending. We hope you we see you again at our next webinar. And have a great weekend. And please remember to answer the survey once you log off. Thank you very much, and thank you, Henny. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. Bye-bye. <clears throat>